Hi, my name is Elizabeth and I would like to take a moment and say welcome and thank you for being here. If you would like to know more of what's going on here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning more about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways, whether you visit our physical location, give online, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. Well, we are um, heading into school year 2021. It's, um, I, I don't know, if, if you've been a parent, you know that everything in your life revolves around school. And when you start early, you're thinking, oh, only 183 more years of this. And making cookies and brownies for maybe some of you moms or maybe dads, I don't know, and going to all the different events and festivities. But then as you get in, your kids are growing, you're realizing, whoa, things are moving ahead here. And then once they're out of school, you kind of realize, well, that's it, life's over. <laughs> it was just that quick, huh? And it's so important. These years for our sons and daughters and our grandkids, these are incredibly important years. If you're a teacher in the public system, uh, high school or elementary, college, university, God bless you. We thank you for what you do where you serve. For those of you homeschool, your mom or dad at the, uh, in your life, but you're also the principal and the teacher and the field trip bus driver and all of that for your homeschooled ones, God himself can't even bless all that. God help you to, to, to keep your sanity in the midst of that. We're appreciative of those of you who homeschool, and we pray for you. And, of course, for those of you who have your kids in private school, especially here at Lighthouse, we're just thrilled that, that we get to host that ministry and to provide it for our community. We have two divisions within Lighthouse. We have Lighthouse Christian Academy and Lighthouse Christian Daycare. I'm going to ask Sister Kathy to come right now. She's our Lighthouse Christian Daycare Director. I'm going to ask Sister Sherry to come as well. She is, as you know, our Lighthouse Christian Academy Director. And uh, I'm going to ask these ladies to help you understand a little bit of what takes place here on our uh, campus. It's more than just school. Uh, so this summer, Sister Kathy, good morning. Good morning. This summer you did what we, I guess it's official that it's day camp. Is that? Yeah, we call it Camp Light, summer okay. daycare. And that goes from what age to what age? Ages 2 to 12. 2 to 12. So in a normal school year, or give or take, the school year is similar for daycare as well. In the normal year, what are your ages? 2, 3, and 4. 2, 3, and 4. So miraculously, this lady transforms from somebody who sees three different eight year ages to one who sees 84 different year ages. Because the difference between a two-year-old and a 12-year-old is the same as between a 20-year-old and an 80-year-old, right? Yes. I mean, listen, gang, I can't even tell you. And in a given school year, what's our normal enrollment for daycare? We had about 115 preschoolers last year, six classes. For those of you who struggle with numbers like me, that's a one, a one, and a five. Now, how many did we have here for day camp this summer, Sister Sh Kathy? 213. Say that again. 213. Uh -huh. it, I had to turn kids away for the first time this summer. I had a waiting list of about 15 kids, which was really hard for me. Um, we've had waiting lists for preschool before, but because we have such an enormous campus, I usually say, oh, yeah, we can take them, we can take them, but... With all those kids comes a lot of paperwork and a lot of food and a lot of staff and a lot of parents and a lot of everything. It was a lot of opportunity to share Jesus and a, a lot of blessing, but a lot of everything. <laughs> so we finally just had to get to the point where we said we can't take any more students. If some of you tried to get a hold of me this summer here at the office and found that I wasn't here as often as I normally am, ha, guess why? There were 213 kids here. Between the ages of 2 and 12. By the way, how many square foot is your office? <laughs> <laughs> I may have already overbooked for fall. I'm already at a wait list. And, uh, <laughs> you see how these two do me? And you have a bathroom in there. It's, yeah, it's just perfect. It's perfect, isn't it? <laughs> have to have so yeah. many uh, square foot per child, and you have to have so many bathrooms per child. So. <laughs> see how they're always spying out the land? These are the invaders, I'm telling you. They come into the promised land to take over. 
We are uh, so thrilled to be hosting Lighthouse Christian Daycare. It's an amazing ministry. Uh, very few of those parents and grandparents attend here. Nobody works harder to encourage them to begin a life of faith here than Sister Kathy does. We work uh, diligently. There's really no purpose. We're not, a, we're not a babysitting ministry. We're not a daycare business. We're trying to reach families with the good news. And this is one of the places that we can do it. Go ahead. You're going to say Amen. something? If you uh, want to pray, you pray right there that that harvest field, both in the school year of those 110 or 20 families and in summer time when the 200s come in, pray that those families will be impacted by something here. And now let me ask the same for Sister Sherry. Um, we had, at the end of the school year last year, Sister Sherry, we had an enrollment in May of... 160 kids. 160 kids. And many of you know, you've heard me say it, you've heard them say it, that was double of where we were the year prior. Um, we ended 2019 uh, at a place where you'd say, oh, this is tough. It's just so hard to be a Christian school in a small community mostly an older community, right? If you go to other cities in the eastern seaboard region or the mid-Atlantic, you know that we're an older city, and our, our infrastructure and our population are somewhat declining, as hard as that is to say. But because of coronavirus, we doubled from 75 to 80 to 160. Here we are, ready to start school manana, correct? <laughs> Tomorrow, C. Yes. C. Yes. And how many, how many do we have enrolled for tomorrow? 170 some odd students. Yeah. Tomorrow. So you can see, even though there's an uptick in concern again about coronavirus, this is really a reflection of this ministry and how these ladies, these guys, this, this team has impacted families. They may not all be attending here at church yet, but they feel so strongly in what's happening for their student that they've re-enrolled them here. Yes. We, we wondered if we would lose students last January after the holidays. Then we wondered at May, as school closed out, will we see a downturn because they'll go back to the way things were before. But you and I know that there are challenges out there, and I don't mean just in the public system, but in our culture. One of those challenges is coronavirus, but the other is how we approach education today and what we're trying to instill in people both in school and in places like the military. We're sending a very strong message that your culture is much more important than your ability to articulate, to speak, to write, to reason. Many of you who are my age or older, you, you see this, that the Goals of education have changed dramatically, and families are starting. We knew that was going to happen. Families now are waking up to that struggle. Well, one of the things that we've done here on the campus this summer to try and help both of these ladies and our church is to step into a new property. A little tiny building here next to us and a tiny little piece of land, eight-tenths of an acre. We, um, we bought that. It's... Um, from where I'm standing, it's off to my left. If you guys park in the right-hand parking lot coming up, it's that little building right at the top of the small development over here, the business development or business park. And when we did that, we, um, we were under a lot of time pressure. It had to be done pretty quickly. They came to us, said, we'd like to do this. And uh, these ladies said, hey, we'll, we'll move forward with it somehow. We've done that. What we'd like to give you the opportunity to do is to help us uh, pay for that. <laughs> and uh, I know that's, well, ooh. <laughs> but Sister Sherry encouraged me that we as believers like to not only give to God's work, but we also like to give to projects within his work. We give to the invisible. We give to ministry, and we let it go, and we say, God bless it as it is used for ministry. But we also like to give to things that are visible, tangible. And that little building and that little piece of property is tangible. It's something we can see. And Sister Sherry said, well, let's give folks an opportunity to not only give towards it, but to leave a legacy about it. If you've been into the Family Life Center, the gym over here, you've seen that sidewalk made out of bricks and there's names in there and whatnot. And we're going to do another 
brick feature somewhere here on the campus. We're not necessarily going to put it over there with that building, but somewhere visible. And in that, it gives you a chance to leave a legacy. If you'd like to buy a brick and do that in honor of a loved one or put your name on there or your student's name, or you can put a scripture verse. Now, I know we did something like this at the pavilion a couple of weeks ago where we just wrote on the rocks, just wrote your name on there, and it was how much did it cost you to invest in that magic marker? And Zero, right? Okay, so you got free on that one. <laughs> we do that here. We give you a free. But then we come back around and say, listen, this is going to be um, permanent and visible, so it's not free. If you'd like to do this, you can use one of the offering envelopes. You can do two things there. You can, on the front, put your name and that you're giving $1,000 for the brick. Now, this isn't to buy a brick. Bricks don't cost that much. This is to invest in the 170-some-odd. I'm not going to use that word anymore. 170-some, because we're hoping, we're believing that none of them are odd, right, Sister Sherry? Yeah, 170-some students this year. And we're believing that 110 or 20 little guys and gals will be here. We're not believing for over 200 in summer camp next year. Right, Sister Kathy? We are not. Well, amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. We, uh, we had that cap. That was a soft cap, I learned. That number was... Su- I don't like it when these ladies are stressed. I don't like it when they're taking on huge challenges like 220 little kids here and workers and all of that. So I say, whoa, well, time out. Too many. You tell them I said no. If, if the parent's mad, tell them to come see me. Sorry, we don't have any room. Make your reservation for 2025 right now. <laughs> for those of you who are pregnant and expecting, <clears throat> you need to see Sister Kathy immediately after the service. Go ahead, get your kid and see Sister Sherry and get them ready for kindergarten, okay? On the back of this, you can write the name that you want on the brick, or the scripture verse, whatever you want displayed. Do we know how many characters are available on a brick? Okay. We're not positive, but we will get you that information because I know you. You'll have that question before the day's out. Uh, the property over there was offered to us at 210, 15, 15,000. We purchased it for 185. So we thank the Lord for that blessing. And uh, the people that own it have been very, very gracious and good to us. And we are very close to taking possession of it now. Uh, school Daycare won't get as much use out of it during the school year, more likely in this summertime program next year. But school and us as a church. There's one lady here on the platform who has a relative coming on staff with us real soon. <clears throat> and... Um, we, we joke because of this, because of what you heard here, there's really no place for youth ministry to take place. So there was some anxiety. And you've got to help bail Sister Sherry out now for her son and have a place. Come on, we've got to have a place for the youth to meet. So help us to do this. Whatever God lays on your heart, we're going to thank you for it. Let's pray this morning. Father, thank you for Sister Kathy and daycare. Great God of heaven, we are so blessed to have this daycare and all that takes place there. Keep those workers safe, we pray. I pray that no harm would come to them or our little ones. I pray that no opportunity the enemy would be presented, that he could cause them harm in any form or fashion. Lord, we live in a day and a time when there's much abuse among kids. And Lord, we thank you for many years of your wall of protection here, and we trust you in praise today that we will enjoy many more years of your godly covering over daycare. Lord, I pray for Sister Sherry today in the academy. Thank you for this turnaround that we saw exactly one year ago. And now, Lord, we're learning what to do with this new reality, how to live in it. Just like our spiritual lives, things suddenly break through. And now we've been set free of something, but we have to learn how to live there, how to think in that new format. I pray for our teachers and workers with Sister Sherry that they will be able to live 
in this new reality of blessing. Lord, meet every need for these ladies. Do an amazing work in them and through them and all of their team. We are so appreciative of what they do day in and day out. And may their ministries be more evangelistically successful and fruitful this school year than in all years previously put together. And we thank you for it today in Jesus' mighty name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. All right, one of these two is going to preach this morning. I think it's this one. Won't you help me welcome Sister Sherry this morning. God bless you, Sister Sherry. Oh, my goodness. Woo. Last year was the most exhausting, thrilling, terrifying year I have ever spent in a school. I I equate it to what it must be like to have triplets. You're thrilled to have triplets, but you're not sleeping, you're working all the time, this doesn't end. And that was what last year was like. And we're coming back into this year exhausted from last still. So, but, but we are going to make a Kristen, where did you first lead worship? Right up here. During what? During Lighthouse Chapel. Yeah. How old were you, Kristen? 11. She was 11. Lisa Tompkins, where'd Lisa go? Lisa, Lisa snuck her into fine arts. We had Kristen, Will, James, and Ryan on this platform. It was not pretty. <laughs> we went through some rough, rough moments, didn't we? But they grew up and they're all ministering today. All ministering today. All ministering today. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? And one of their last chapels together, they said, let's freak Mrs. Expedo out. Here's what we're going to do. They had one on drums, one on bass, one on guitar, and Kristen on keyboard. And they played a song, and then they all got up, and they clockwise turned, and they started playing different instruments. And then they did it again, and they did it again until they ended up back. Do you remember that? That was awesome. God will work through our young people. We're going to get them. We're going to get them while they're young. We're going to keep them. We're going to turn the kingdom on fire with kids like Kristen. How much do you need? 2,500. Would it not be awesome if this her home church, her home place, sent her out and finished it off today. Can we do that? Come on, who can do that? Somebody grab your tithe envelope, put it down, Kristen Morrison, get her the money she needs and let it be done today as she goes on the mission field. Amen? Whew. Do you know what today is? Sunday. Back to school Sunday. Sunday. Or as teachers call it, the day before school starts or the night when no one sleeps. His teachers will wake up tonight at 1 a.m. Who was that kid on that list? At 2 a.m. I don't think I'm going to have enough snack. At 3 a.m. Oh, no, I forgot to buy whatever, fill in the blanks. They will be up all night. And so when they're cranky tomorrow, the first day of school, you'll know why. So we're buying this building. It is so cool. And I noticed, I was actually here as school administrator way back in the day. And I'm looking at those bricks one day out there by the thing. And I noticed an interesting name on there. Do you have those guys? Do you have that? Do they have that? There it is. I was like, I know those people. That's pretty awesome, cool. And then I looked at the date when these bricks were purchased. Do we have that, guys? Walk of Faith, dedicated 1998. 
In 1998, Jonathan was three and James was five. I was living in Philadelphia. I was perfectly content with what I was doing at the University of Valley Forge. I loved teaching at the college level. I loved my summers off. I loved everything about teaching college, and I had no intention of coming back here. But my parents invested... This church built that educational building and that gymnasium for cash. And my parents invested, and they put my son's name on there, not knowing if they would even ever use it. And then we came home and moved in with them. And my kids were here seven days a week. This was their neighborhood. This was where they hung out. This is where they figured out how to get up on the roof. Thank you, Kyle. This was, this was their world. We played basketball on Saturdays. I came in and worked. We were here for church all day on Sundays. We were here seven days a week. My kids got more use out of this facility than anybody else has. And my parents gave in faith. So guess what? Now you have a chance. We've got a building over there with closing costs. It's what, 190? Pastor Adam, 190,000? I only need 190 of you to give $1,000 each. You're laughing. I'm serious. Get a brick. Guess what I'm going to do? My son's grandparents, in faith, put their name on a brick for a building they didn't even know they would ever use. So I'm getting a brick, and it's going to say Julieta Aspido for my granddaughter because I'm going to do it by faith that right there she's going to walk on this campus and she's going to know Jesus and she's going to learn to love Jesus and she's going to learn to do ministry even as young as 11. Hello? Hello? So some of you grandparents, get your checkbook out right now, fill out the tithe envelope, go ahead, do it. Be done with it. God's dealing with you, so you might as well do it. Now go home and pray about it. We're trusting God that we can have that building just paid for, done. We're not borrowing one penny. Hello? We're not bar- borrowing one penny. We're not paying any interest. We need that space. We need a youth room. We need an after-school room. We need a science lab. We need, I could go on and on and on, but you get the idea. Help us out. Let's get that done. That's a really cool brick. We call her Jules. I thought we'd go formal, though. All right. Tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. 170 kids in the academy and 100 plus in the daycare will hear the words, get up and get dressed. So the title of my sermon today is Get Up and Get Dressed. It's time to get up and get dressed. Paul said, wake up, sleeper. We've got work to do. Get up and get dressed. If you can't see that, that's a guy dressed in his armor, ready to fight. Now, way back in the day when I was four and five, back at Old Central, and those of you who grew up here in the 60s and 70s, remember there was a room behind the platform up above where my my grandmother and all of her sisters taught the four and five-year-olds to sing, I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the... Artillery. Remember that one? Huh? We all learned that. And I thought it was a kind of a weird song for church. But if you learn that song, we knew onward Christian soldiers marching as to war. Remember that one? We knew we were in a battle. We've kind of forgotten that. Well, Jesus loves me because he gave me a parking space right next to Walmart. Right next to the door, he loves me. Life has gotten easy. And we've forgotten that we're in a battle. And so I'm here to tell you today, I'm here to remind you today to get up and get dressed. Because we're in a battle for souls and I need you. 
I need somebody to hold up my hands when the going gets tough. And believe me, this week it got tough. I need, I need a teacher for tomorrow. Now, I have a teacher, but she has to give two weeks' notice. So I need a teacher tomorrow. So if, you have a reti- if you're a retired teacher or you know a retired teacher, you text them right now. Tell them I need them tomorrow morning. I had one. Friday, everything was beautiful. Calm. I thought I should go to Rocky Gap and get on a boat. Everything was calm. And then I got a text. And then I got a Facebook message. And the teacher that I had planned to come in to help has bronchitis, the doctor said, three weeks. I was like, you have got to be kidding me. I was so mad on Friday. I left my office. I said, if you need me, use my cell phone. I went up to the, my summer office, the pavilion. And prayed and tried to pull myself together. There was only one other person up there. Pastor. (laughs) His summer office, yes. So I need that tomorrow. I also need a janitor just for this week, five days. Volunteers to clean the boys' urinals, please. Volunteer. We have new technology, guys. It's amazing. It's called a spray bottle. And if I have to clean that boy's bathroom, it's not going to, it's going to, please don't make me clean the boy's bathroom tomorrow, y'all. Come on. Somebody has three hours tomorrow. They can clean the boy's bathroom. Not that it takes three hours, but it should. You can smell it before you see it. Somebody said, where's the boy's bathroom? I said, use your nose. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We do clean things around here. We really do. Oh, goodness. And then I made a mistake and put too many kids in second grade. Now I need an instructional assistant in second grade. School starts tomorrow. How many hours is that? Get up and get dressed. I need you. Get up and get dressed. I need you. I need you to pray for us. I need you to intercede for us. I need you to pray over this generation. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6, please. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Ephesians is called an epistle, which is really a letter. It's written by Paul. And it was meant to be read orally, and it was meant to be read in one sitting. So if you really want to know what Ephesians is like, start at chapter 1 and read through to chapter 6. Because when you do that, you're going to see what things Paul is emphasizing. And so when I look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. And I kept thinking about that word finally. Why is finally there? Finally. If there is a finally there, then there must have been something prior in the book of Ephesians that Paul was going to summarize in this passage, 1018, where he talks about the armor of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. So because context is everything in Scripture, I went back to Ephesians chapter 1, and I started to read there. So everybody, page back a couple of pages to the beginning to chapter 1. And in Ephesians chapter 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people. Okay, to God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. God's, what kind of people? What kind of people? To God's holy people 
in Ephesus, God is looking for a holy bride. God is looking for pureness and holiness and righteousness in his bride. To God's holy people in Ephesus. I pray, now look down at verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. The riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. And his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is invoked, not only in this present name, but also not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church. Did you hear that? From the first chapter to the last chapter of Ephesians, Paul was saying, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. That power, the same mighty strength that he used to raise Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you. It is that mighty power that he gives us that enables us to stand. It enabled the three Hebrew children to stand when everyone else bowed to the idol. It enabled Daniel to stand in the lion's den. Whether you're standing in front of a Red Sea this morning, that is not parting, or you're at an airport in Kabul. It's his mighty power that enables you to stand. And Paul said, finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. You're not going to make it. If we go through tribulation and we go through persecution, you're going to make it? We've got missionaries right now who are hiding in Afghanistan. Because when the Taliban is going door to door and saying, let me see your phone. You have a Bible app on your phone? Come with me. You know why? Because Christians live in freedom. Christians are free in their spirit. And Christians are free in Christ. And Christians have the mighty power of Christ within them. Ephesians 2, Paul said, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live, but now you are made alive in Christ. Hello. You're made alive in Christ. It's his mighty power that dwells in you. And God raised us with Christ. It's that power that took Saul, a terrorist, to Christians and made him an apostle to the Gentiles. It's that power that takes your own self-righteousness that is nothing but dirty rags and makes you pure and holy. It's that power that can change your life and raise you from the death of your sins and from your bondage. It's that power mighty power. So brothers and sisters, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, because that's the only thing that's going to get us through. And I'm not interested in a lot of kids coming in here and spouting memory verses and quoting the memory verses. I'm interested in kids who are at this altar, who know in whom they have believed, who know that Jesus Christ lives within them and that Jesus Christ is their best friend. Because if you only believe up here, you're not going to make it. Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. I heard somebody say, oh, we never worry about Christians. They can't stay together for more than six months. They form a movement, and after six months, they're fighting about something, and they break apart. Paul said there's one body. We better get together. We better know in whom we have believed. And we better stand for righteousness. Put on the whole armor. Get up and get. Thank you. Kristen, when you started to sing Rattle, March 2019, we closed our school March 13th. Friday, March 13th, 2019. We closed down because of coronavirus, and I knew in my spirit we weren't coming back that year. 
I told the teacher, send everything home with the kids. Send it all. They didn't. Why do they not listen to me? Well, I sent two weeks' worth. I didn't know if we'd survive. I didn't know if we could pay salary throughout the summer. And that's about the time Rattle came out. And I sent it to my teachers and I said, this is our theme song. If God wants this school to live, it will live. He will breathe on these dry bones and it will live. And if he does not want it to live, it will not live. And it is his school and we're going to either go forward or we're going to stop right here. And I said, Lord, it's your school. So if you don't want this ministry here, then you can stop it right now. But if it's your, if you want this ministry, then speak life. And God spoke life. And in three weeks last August, our phone did not stop ringing. And we, in, we enrolled and we enrolled and we enrolled and we enrolled. And oh my goodness, what a year. God is good. This little girl looked at me and said, we're going to pray? I don't know how to pray. I said, I'm going to teach you how to pray. And then she said about chapel, another little girl came in because they were coming in all year long. Here's one, here's another one, here's another one, here's another one. The teachers were like, please stop. I'm like, "Uh uh-uh. We still have pastor's office we can fill. And I said, and um, this little girl looked at the other one. She said, every morning we go into this great big room where we celebrate chapel. I had to tell her we didn't go every morning. But once a week, we come in here and we celebrate Jesus. Amen. Paul said in Ephesians 3, he talked about the mighty power. He said, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Hallelujah. In Ephesians 3, 16, he says that God might strengthen you with power through his spirit, that you may have power together with the Lord's holy people. Verse 20, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. This summer I was coming across the foyer from the school to the church. I had a purpose. You can tell when I have a purpose. I needed more space. It's not that we don't have some space. It's that I don't have classrooms that are small enough to go in that space. Hallelujah. And I was coming across to say I need another classroom, y'all. We need to get on it. We need to order a big modular. We need to get it here, blah, 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 blah. And they said, we got a phone call. And it's attached to us. It's right there. It steps away. God knew we needed that space. God provided that space. Get on board, guys. Amen? We're going to need a high school next, but we'll pray about that later. Go back to Ephesians 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Get up and get. Ephesians 6, 13. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, and it's coming. Hello? Can you feel the darkness? Huh? You may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand. When you have done everything to stand, stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. If you don't know that Jesus loves me, this I know. If you don't know it, not up here, but in here, you're not going to make it. It's all about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm tired of Christians in name only. Hello? You call yourself a Christian. You better be more than a Christian in name only. You better know my Jesus. Hello? 
I thought, what does Paul mean when he says the belt of truth? Well, back in Ephesians 1, he calls the gospel the message of truth. In Ephesians 4, he says, speaking the truth in love. And in Ephesians, the end of 4, 25 and 26, he says, put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. We are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. That's my favorite verse. It's always been my favorite verse. Now, when I was a kid, that was my favorite verse. Don't be so angry. Paul said I could be angry if I don't sin. And then Ephesians 4, 17, Paul said, So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed." That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. The belt of truth that is in Jesus. Darkened in their understanding, Paul said. Well, love is love. I've never seen him, heard a more ignorant statement. Well, love is love. And sin is sin. And it's God's holy people. We have forgotten the idea that when you are a Christian, you have to put down your old self. Hello? You have to put that down. Paul said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You have to accept what God says is truth, not what the culture says is truth. Hello? I mean, come on, people. It's time we quit playing games. It's time we become God's holy people. It's time we put on the belt of truth. And that breastplate of righteousness, it's not my righteousness, it's his righteousness. And that means I have to bow the knee. That means there are things I can't watch on TV. Hello? There's fewer and fewer things I can watch. Because it's, it's reeking with perversion and we're trying to normalize everything in our culture and it will not be normalized in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because sin is still sin and God is still holy and he's looking for a bride without spot or wrinkle that has been washed in the blood of the lamb because it is the blood and it is only the blood of Jesus Christ that will make us righteous. And that's what the world doesn't understand. We're not condemning the world for being sinners because they're sinners. We're loving them and we're praying for them and we're trying to lead them to Jesus. But you got to be under the blood. You got to get it right. You've got to be pure and holy because that's the bride he's coming for. And if you don't have oil in that lamp, you're not going. Get it right. Get it right, not just for you, but get it right for your kids. You know why we've got to put the armor on? Because you've got kids and you've got grandkids. That's why you have to put the armor on. And we've got to pray up here like we're going to war, folks, because we're in a battle for their, those lives. Do you know I spend more time speaking to grandparents than I do to parents? Because the grandparents are raising the kids because we have a missing generation. And I'm tired of it. And I'm sick of it. I told this one parent, and I shouldn't have. I said, if that boy was my grandson, I would take him from you right now. Because you need to get your act together. 
You expect him to behave and look at you. I prayed after that one for a while. (laughs) If I ever end up in jail, just send books, okay? I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Maybe some sand so I can pretend I'm at the beach, but uh, maybe, you know, a sun lamp kind of, you know. I'm serious, though. I'm tired of broken kids. I deal with broken kids all day long who look at me and tell me no because they've never, they've never had to be obedient. God talks about the disobedient. We have to treat, teach our kids to be obedient because God expects them to be obedient. Because Christ went to a cross. That's how deadly your sin is and my sin is. He had to go to a cross. If it was just, well, love is love, why did Jesus have to go to a cross? And when Paul was writing to the Ephesians, Ephesians was where the temple of Diana or Artemis was, and it was a city filled with immorality. Sound familiar? Get up and get. I'm out of time. (laughs) But I'm going to go, let me just finish reading Ephesians 6. don't know where I am now. Stand firm then. Oh, in verse Ephesians 5, but among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are not, because these are improper for God's holy people. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of God. An idolater, because you put what you want before obedience to God. You make that thing an idol. Why are you being so hard today, Sherry? I don't know, because I'm tired. I'm really, really tired. And I need some of you to hold up my hands. And I need y'all to be holy. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You better know what the word says. People think that because Paul wrote Ephesians, it's really not part of the Bible. Honey, it's all Bible. It's all the word of God. There isn't a pecking order of which is more word of God or more anointed than anything else. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep praying for all the Lord's people. Ephesians 1 to 3 Paul tells us who we are in Christ. And in 4 to 6, he tells us what we should do about it. And what we should do about it is get up and get dressed. Get your armor on, folks. We're going into battle. Stand. Be God's holy people. God says, be holy because I am holy. Back to school. Tomorrow or Wednesday, or whenever your kids and your grandkids are going back to school. We need to pray them. We need to pray in the spirit. We need to pray for who and what they will encounter. We need to put the armor on them, teach them how to armor themselves and stand. Get up and get dressed. Pastor.
when we think about all that we face, the greatest thing that we face is the passage of time, right? Doesn't matter what happens in the nations, doesn't happen, no matter what happens in political movements, time is moving and we are accountable. Not only is it appointed unto us to once to die, but we've been given one life. How many of you, how many of you struggle with having three or four different lives, right? No, we have one and we're responsible for it. Would you stand with me this morning as we prepare to uh, close out? Sister Kristen, come on to the piano, please. And really, our only responsibility is to know God. But you and I have learned, right, that when we know God, certain things begin to be revealed to us. They become unveiled. We see things because we know God. Some of those things are we know that we have to worship him don't we? we? We learn that we are called to worship God. Then we recognize that we're to make him known to other people. Part of the way we do that, of course, is how through how we live. It's also through where we invest. We give our time, you know, Lighthouse and Lighthouse Christian Daycare. These are places where we give a lot. We invest there. And isn't it so amazing to see that investment coming back around. The school is over 20 years old now. We're beginning to see the incredible fruit of all that God has done there. You did that. It takes time. Now in these last couple of moments this morning, I want to ask you about the time and how you want to invest. When you and I invest with God, we invest over the long haul. Your prayers, you may not see them answered the way you want later today or even tomorrow, but God is at work. Would you bow your hearts with me for just a moment this morning as, as we prepare to allow him to work among us? What is it that you're praying about? I hope Sister Sherry encouraged you in many ways today. And one of those ways, I believe that she's encouraged us and I hope she has encouraged you is to understand the long-term payoff, the long-term, long-range work of God in how he moves through us in our prayers and in our faith. Come on, right now, you're believing for your kids, your son or daughter, you're believing for your grandkids. Yeah, I would love for every family to experience wholeness. I would love for every family to be able to stay together and for those kids to be raised in that home without any sort of division. But that's not reality. It's not where we live today. God's not surprised by our culture, and he can adapt. He changes the situation, or he changes the participants in the situation. Father, we pray for boys and girls right now, for those who are coming out of a lot of brokenness in their home. We pray for those who are being raised because of an addiction or maybe even a death. They're being raised by somebody other than mom and dad. They're going through untold heartache. They don't understand that there's still stability. They feel that everything is instable, unstable. Everything is upside down. And in their world, everything is crashing. God, we pray for boys and girls who are going to feel overwhelmed as they enter our doors tomorrow. And I pray for our moms or dads, our grandparents. I pray for our teachers, Lord, as they come into this place tomorrow, may there be an anointing there for them to be that bridge for a hurting boy or a troubled girl. I pray for teachers in the public system who are here this morning, Lord, teachers in our schools here in Allegheny County or Mineral. Maybe they're in Pennsylvania and Bedford County or one of the other counties. Lord, for those who are in the universities here, Allegheny College or Frostburg or one of the others, Potomac, wherever it might be, Lord, use them to be a light in a dark place and to create opportunities for hurting and broken kids. Now, while you're praying right there where you are, if you have a son or a daughter that's a student, school, college, graduate school, or you have a grandson or granddaughter and you're just making them a matter of prayer right now, would you slip your hand up? Not to me, but to the Lord. And let's, let's mention them by name. You, you tell the Lord right now their name. Tell him 
Lord, I'm praying. I'm praying for my baby today. I'm praying for this young man that he will not be swayed by the things going on around him. The darkness in the culture will not destroy him or his friend and what he's going through will not destroy him. I pray, Lord, for fifth and sixth and seventh grade boys that they will not be drugged down by friends who are themselves in darkness and bondage. I pray for eighth and ninth grade girls that they will not be brought into a world of darkness and brokenness because of a friend that was poorly chosen. Sister Sherry said the Bible tells us to pray in the Spirit on all occasions and for everything. Come on, let this be a spiritual moment that you're praying for your child, your student, maybe your grandchild, but it's a student, a son, daughter, grandson that's in college, and you need God to be there with them and to bless them and to protect them. Maybe you're praying for tuition. Maybe you're praying for miracles. Father, today we're believing that you're going to do mighty and amazing things through this school year for our students. Now you can take your hand down. If you're a student here today, you're a student in the building. School, elementary, high school, college, you're a student. Slip your hand up for just a moment. I want to pray for you, students. And if you're a teacher, you hold your hand up or an administrator, but you work in the system. Now, Father, I pray today in the mighty name of Jesus for these who are believing that this is going to be an amazing year for them. Lord, in the midst of the battles, in the midst of coronavirus, in the midst of a chaotic culture, God, visit, I pray, teachers and administrators. Help students and teachers. God, may your anointing give them the courage to stand, standing strong in the power of the Holy Spirit, standing confident that God's way in the long range is a way of blessing, is a way of fullness and hope. Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. We break strongholds and we break entanglements in Jesus' name. We come against oppression and affliction. We break entanglements with friends that are not friends. We break entanglements with friends that are assigned by the enemy to pull believers down in Jesus' name. Church, you can tell that I feel that something's happening in that area right now, and I feel it so strongly. Students, you can be a friend to people who are in darkness if you know who you are in God. But if you allow a friend in darkness to pull you there, I need to warn you. I need to encourage you. That's the wrong way. It's a bad choice. Nothing good's going to come of it. You're going to regret how far you go. You're going to regret how dark it gets. Young lady, listen to me. Stay strong in the Lord. Stand on your principles. Young man, hear me. Friends can convince you to go places you would never go otherwise. They can convince you to do things you know you don't even want to do. Father, help us, help us in the mighty name of Jesus. Help us today to stand in these evil hours in which we live. Mm. Yeah, that's it. You're praying for your student. You're praying for your spouse who's a teacher, administrator. You're praying together. You're believing that in this worst moment we've faced in a long time in our nation, you're believing that God is going to do incredible things. Now, Lord, we thank you today. We thank you for what you've done in this house. We came here today to be encouraged, and you've encouraged us. We came here today to be supported, and we feel the foundation of our faith strongly underneath of us. We came here today, Lord, to have vision for the future, and we walk out of here prophetic, knowing that our God is in control. We walk out of here prophetic, knowing that our God is speaking in these last days, and we walk out of here, Lord, prophetic, knowing that our kids and our grandkids are subject to the prayers and intercession of their parents and grandparents, their teachers in this church. Lord, we're praying today and we'll pray throughout this school year that what we see here today is just the first Christian of many dozens, just the first sent out of many dozens from our school. Hallelujah. 
Now may the Lord meet every need here today. May he make his face to shine upon you. May his favor be in your, in your mind and on your heart and visible in your life every day. I pray that he would assign his angels to you, that his angels would stand watch round about you, guardian angels, warring angels at all times. I pray that God would make you the head and not the tail, the lender and not the borrower. I pray that God would make you a blessing to many others, that he would use you to break the curse in the lives of others. I pray that God would open doors that no man could shut and that he would keep doors closed that represent harm to you. I pray that God will answer your prayers and guide you by his strong hand and that he will give you everything you need and keep from you anything that will destroy. I pray that God will prosper you, that even in this day of pandemic, God will meet your needs and he'll prosper you. And may the Lord speak into your heart so that you're aware that he's with you and will never leave you, never abandon you, never forsake you, that you'll never be alone, that he's with you. Even when you're in your house by yourself, he's with you. That you're not a widow, he's with you. You're not a widower, he's with you. That God will never leave you. He's standing with you. May you know that today and always. Father, we thank you for Sister Kathy, Sister Sherry, and their entire team of servants. Bless them this year. Meet the needs. We thank you for this host church, Lord. I pray that you would continue to allow us to be healthy enough to provide cover for these ministries. And may they flourish every day. In Jesus' mighty, holy name, all of God's people said, amen, amen. I love you in the Lord. Sister Kristen, thank you so much. God bless you, church. Have a beautiful day. If I don't see you before, I'll see you on Wednesday night. Give myself away.